Yeah, I think it's finally time we head back into the Mega Man series. We got Mega Man 11 coming out in a couple of months, but a lot of people are also excited for the upcoming Mega Man X Legacy Collection. All eight games are being split into two packages, but that's a complaint for another time. So I figured, all right, last time I was here, I gave the classic series a look at, so it's time for the next chapter of Mega Man games, and ones that I'm a little more familiar with. Indeed, the X series is where I was first exposed to the Blue Bomber's legacy. Mega Man 6 was my first classic Mega Man game, but Mega Man X was my first Mega Man game period and I've been playing it since 1994. And spoiler warning because this may be incredibly obvious to some of you watching already, but I fucking love this game. It's one of my favorites of all time. I can go back to this any day, any time, never tired of it. Wanted to make that clear before getting this video started before I inevitably start a gushing. But you know, what is Mega Man X? Was it the 10th entry of the series before the 10th entry of the series was a thing 17 years later? Later. Like before, we have several games to cover for this marathon, but Mega Man X gets its own video because I have the most memories of this game specifically. And it did start the whole X lineup, so I think it deserves some special attention. Mega Man X was Capcom's way of bringing the Blue Bomber into the next generation of consoles. The original series was going strong, in fact Mega Man 6 was still released for the NES just two months after Mega Man X was released, but classic Mega Man started to wear a little thin, so it was time for the developers to inject new life. It was time for Mega Man to make his 16-bit transition. And a lot of Mega Man's previous development team were turn to start this new series, including Keiji Inafune, of course, and producer Tokuro Fujiwara, who's been involved since the first Mega Man title. The year is 1993, the Super Nintendo was already an established thing for about two years at this point, and since this is the 1990s we're talking about, this is the time where a lot of things were getting their darker and edgier makeover, comic books, movies, music. Not sure if it was just Capcom trying to follow the trends, but the idea was to create a more hardcore Mega Man. Something less Astro Boy and more like the Terminator. Okay, slight exaggeration, but the setup of the game doesn't lie. This was a darker Mega Man title, and it hits you as soon as you start the game up. We get this boot up screen of someone logging into the computer. It's later revealed to be Dr. Kane, but holy shit, over 32,000 terabytes of memory? This motherfucker's got the entirety of Pornhub in there, goddamn! But no, then we get a cool sequence of the new Mega Man schematics. There's a lot of techno jargon, micro fusion, fuel tank, lightweight titanium X alloy for skin, probably about 20 USB ports up his ass or some other shit, but then we suddenly get this flashing red screen warning us that this new Mega Man is possibly the most dangerous thing on the planet. And it's such a jarring contrast, isn't it? Like, I can imagine those who grew up with classic Mega Man used to the bright and colorful atmosphere, he's running in the sunlight, mission accomplished, and then they play Mega Man X and it's like, THIS MOTHERFUCKER WILL KILL YOU! Mega Man X, or just X as it's shortened to, was the very last creation of Dr. Thomas Light. His goal was to make a robot that had total free will, the ability to think, feel, and make their own decisions, which is funny because as the years went on, classic Mega Man already sort of had those features, but whatever. Dr. Light was going big this time around and basically wanted to create life anew. But fearing that the world wasn't ready for the sleeping technology, but were perfectly okay with Clown Man, Dr. Light sealed X inside a capsule for 30 years to test out his internal systems to make sure he was the reliable robot he had yearned his second, uh, third son to be. Unfortunately, Dr. Light would later die during this period and had no one to carry his work because I'm guessing everyone else died? This is the biggest mystery of the X series that to this day has not been directly answered. What happened to classic Mega Man or Proto Man? What about Roll, Rush, Auto for Christ's sakes? There's literally no one from the previous era alive? Yeah, they're all gone. This is a new generation of Mega Man after all. But years pass, we're now in 21 blah blah blah, blah and X is eventually discovered by one Dr. Kane who was so impressed by X's eternal machinations that it inspires him to design robots just like him called Reploids, short for Replicant Android. You ever seen Blade Runner anyway? In the in coming years, human and Reploids coexisted, but over the course of time, crimes committed by Reploids slowly began to rise. In response, a special force of robots was created to deal with rogue Reploids, later identified as Mavericks. Led by their commander Sigma, who may or may not be an actual dickhead, X was enlisted into the Maverick Hunters, joined by his buddy Zero, who in fact was Keiji Inafune's original design for Mega Man X, but it was deemed too radically different. In a game that kills off all the previous characters, and that's where the line was drawn, alright. Zero was later made into X's partner in combat in favor of X's design being something more familiar. I do love X's look, it feels like a natural evolution of his classic counterpart, but in the American box art he's fucking pissed and he can't aim for shit. The Japanese box art kind of continues the trend of Rockman covers where it's just an ensemble of the heroes and bad guys, my favorite being Sigma, it's like, yeah, how's it going everybody, yeah, I'm Sigma, hey! Anyway, the Maverick Hunters were created to deal with the bad robots, but then one day, out of nowhere, Commander Sigma himself went Maverick and yearns to wipe out humanity for the sake of making a future for only Reploids as he 
thinks Reploids are the next step in evolutions, like Magneto and his Brotherhood of Reploids. So together with his partner Zero, X takes up his arm cannon and makes it his mission to stop Sigma's forces and eventually Sigma himself. And it should be said that most of this comes from the manual of the game and the PSP remake of Mega Man X, which I'll cover later, because in the actual game itself, as soon as you hit the start button, you're just thrown into the game. There's a bit of dialogue here and there with X being unsure of himself as a capable fighter, but the entirety of Mega Man X is dealing with the aftermath of Sigma's betrayal. The X series as a whole is more involved with this plot than the classic series, as we'll see the further we go into these games, but it still shares a lot of tropes from the previous generation. Mavericks, for instance, are the series Robot Masters, and Sigma is the series Dr. Wily. <laughs> But there we go, we got our setup, and it's certainly a darker take on Mega Man thus far, but to me, this also extends beyond the plot. This game's aesthetic also oozes with a darker tone. The opening stage is a decimated highway. The first boss, Vile, ends up mopping the floor with you, and you almost die as a result, but you're saved at the last second by zero. But it kind of makes you feel a little hopeless. Most of the stages involve X-rating weapon and military bases, about as cold and sterile as the very robots that occupy them. And the visuals are one thing, but even the sound design lays on the tonal shift. One of my favorite tracks in this game is, believe it or not, the theme that plays before you encounter a major boss. It's so unsettling because this ain't classic Mega Man anymore. You're in a time far removed from it, and as someone who has finally played all those damn classic games, I can see that easily now. Of course, Mega Man X isn't HR Geiger Grimm. It isn't that radically different from the classic series. At the end of the day, it's a faster paced Mega Man. And I certainly didn't think any of that shit when I first played this so many years ago. I was more like, oh man, this game looks so cool. Look at the size of my charge shot. Holy shit, that is awesome. I'm climbing walls, I'm shooting a penguin in the face, and goddamn, this soundtrack is fantastic. It's still, even today, my favorite Mega Man soundtrack, like across the entire franchise, the compositions wonderfully use the SNES soundtrack to its fullest potential to deliver a score that's varied, grungy, because this was the 90s, energetic, atmospheric, and goddamn it's so ear grabbing. My favorites being Boomer Kowanger, Storm Eagle, Sting Chameleon, Armored Armadillo, all of Sigma stages, the boss music, both variations. I even love the password theme. The password theme. We're talking about a screen on a game that you probably skip past in half a second, but oh. Oh, the sound design, I should mention, is also something I wholeheartedly love. It's very minor shit, don't get me wrong, but I love the sound of my charge shot, the impact of hitting a boss, riding a giant mech, the sound of the shutter door closing behind me. I don't know why, but I fucking love that sound. Mega Man X isn't too far removed from its classic foundation as far as gameplay goes. Just like before, you can run, jump, and shoot power pellets from your trusty arm cannon. There's a total of eight Mavericks to take down. You absorb their special abilities when you defeat them, giving you more weapons to add to your arsenal that you can experiment with, while also giving you the potential advantage against the next boss, as some are weak against specific weapons. When all eight Mavericks are defeated, you find your way to Sigma's Fortress for a total of four stages, ending with a climatic battle against Darth Mr. Clean. Stage themes are generally tied to the Maverick in charge. Flame Mammoth, for example, hides inside a fiery scrap heap, while Chill Penguin hangs out in an Arctic region. It's fundamental, but one detail I love is that certain stages actually change depending on which Maverick you've already taken out. In Spark Mandrel's level, there's electrical currents all over the floor and it makes his mini boss a pain in the ass with its constant lightning bolts, but if you cleared, say, Storm Eagle beforehand, you cause his ship to crash into Spark Mandrel's base, causing a power outage. The electrical currents are gone, the mini boss is now a total joke, and though you have to deal with a couple of blackouts, it's not as annoying as before. Want to get rid of the lava and flame mammoth stage? Take out Chill Penguin first and watch as the whacked out climate freezes everything over, opening up new pathways that may or may not contain stuff like heart containers, permanent upgrades to X's health. Yeah, this is sort of weird now that I look back. X doesn't have much health when he starts off compared to the original Mega Man that had max health from the start in every game. You gotta find heart containers if you want more health now, and I'm on and on with this, honestly. On one hand, I love the feeling of discovering these. On the other hand, it's a gameplay element that exists by taking something established, in this case, a full health bar, and cutting it into pieces. And it's like this for every game. So X, I mean, what the fuck are you doing, man? Your health is as flimsy as Samus's power armor. But I love this sort of design. You can tackle any stage in any order if you want to, or you can make things easier for yourself if you do things in a certain way. It's good for first time players. And then later, if you're feeling confident, you can try and defeat bosses in this order or that order. I've done that plenty of times in this game. It also sort of helps that Mega Man X is not as tough as earlier entries in the series, and a big part of that, I feel, lies in X's very potential. Instead of energy tanks, X can collect sub-tanks, permanent storage containers that fill up every time you collect a health pickup when your health is already maxed out. In an emergency, you can use the energy stored inside the sub-tank to give yourself a little breathing room. And while it's true you have to fill up the tank yourself to get the most out of it instead of the one-and-done full restore of the energy tanks, I really like how sub-tanks are permanent, there's a total of four in the game, and if you know the right spots, filling the tanks up take no time at all, although the bad population is seriously fucked. 
An immediate difference between X and classic Mega Man is X's wall cling. You can hug any wall that isn't hazardous and jump off to climb it, allowing for some of the most vertical level design we've seen at this point in time. It's a lifesaver in situations that would have spelled death in the classic games, because say if you get knocked back into a pit, because yes, knockback is a thing in this game, you could potentially hug the wall and kick yourself back up. That's wonderful, but it doesn't stop there, because there's also permanent armor upgrades you can find in certain stages that delayed Dr. Light left for you to find. Don't know why these weren't just built into his core design, but I won't speak ill of the dead, not just yet. You can increase your armor to take more hits, you can upgrade your charge shot to be more powerful, that also lets you charge your special weapons to create some vastly different effects. Being able to charge special weapons is so cool, I love charging up the storm tornado and launching a funnel of death that nukes the hell out of these sea dragons. But the leg upgrade is undoubtedly the most important, and the one you'll most likely find first because they don't even try to hide this shit from you. It's very simple, just lets you dash and make longer jumps, but this, along with the wall cling, transforms Mega Man X into a very fast paced game. Now I'm not talking Sonic fast, but look at this, you can never achieve this sort of speed before, and combined with the wall cling, it's fluid, responsive, and not at all punishing. Yeah, I would still recommend exercise and caution, take it from me, I lose myself in the movement in this game because I find it so exhilarating, but you know, I get hit a lot because of that shit. But with this kind of mobility, it's easier to avoid oncoming projectiles and all that, although this game does have an annoying holdover from the NES games, where enemies that die immediately respawn the moment you go slightly off screen. It can get a little chaotic in some spots and looks jank as hell, but it does help that X is pretty damn capable of defending himself. Even better when you start defeating these bosses and get to use their weapons. God, I love the weapons in this game. A flamethrower, a tornado shot, an icy shotgun that you can ride like a surfboard, two types of shields, homing torpedoes, boomerangs that can pick up items, and you can switch between weapons on the fly by just hitting the shoulder buttons without breaking the pace. Later on, you can even score the Hadouken from Street Fighter, and though you need full health to use it, it can one-shot anything. It's a little morbid on how you get it, though. You make this jump off of this platform, collect this energy capsule, and then... Uh, jump off the cliff and die and you do it about four more times. Dr. Light, what the fuck is wrong with you, man? That's a good question. So you got all your weapons, you got all your upgrades, it's time to head into Sigma's fortress. And another thing I really like is that unlike Wily's castle, it isn't a gauntlet, meaning every time you finish a stage, you can head on out, refill your sub tanks, and head back inside completely refreshed. You take on Vile again, only you're much stronger this time. Yeah, don't you face, motherfucker! Your buddy Zero ends up sacrificing himself to give you the advantage, see you next game, buddy. And finally, it's just you, Sigma, and a potential lawsuit from George Lucas. No, seriously, Capcom was pushing this shit. I mean, Vile is a simple color swap away from being Boba Fett. I, I guess they really enjoyed Star Wars. Anywho, X defeats Sigma, saves the day, and watches as Castlevania crumbles over the horizon. X then begins to ponder about his purpose in life and how long he must keep fighting to ensure peace. And spoiler warning, that isn't getting old anytime soon. And that's Mega Man X. I mean, I've said it before, I'll say it again. I love the hell out of this game. I love the changes it brought to the formula. I love the fast-paced gameplay. I love the upgrades, the weapons, the stages, the boss fights, the look, the sound. I don't think there exists a perfect video game, but Mega Man X, I gotta say, it's way up there, man. For over 20 years, this game has repeated delivered a sense of joy that only a few others have come close to reaching in this genre specifically. Goes without saying, but I'm gonna say it anyway, play this, please. It's available on a lot of platforms, the SNES, the Virtual Console, X Collection, the upcoming Legacy Collection. I would even recommend Maverick Hunter X. Yes, much like Mega Man Powered Up, Maverick Hunter X was Capcom's attempt at rebooting the X series with a 2.5D remake of the first game complete with new graphics, an enhanced soundtrack, a fleshed out story with more character development, sort of, and additional content in the form of a playable vial who has his own campaign along with his own personal arsenal of weapons to bring in a large variety of pain. It was a failed attempt, of course, because it was on the PSP. Don't get me wrong, I love the damn thing, but not enough people did, and I don't understand why Capcom thought it was the best option to choose for their Mega Man reboots. They should have waited a couple of years for the 3DS. A shame, too, because this isn't a bad remake at all. I still prefer the SNES original, but the game looks and sounds great, the remix soundtrack is a joy to the ears, and I appreciate the added story elements to make X's world more interesting. You learn a little more about the Mavericks. When you finish the game, you unlock the Day of Sigma, a near 25-minute long animated short that goes into Sigma's modus returning to the dark side, which sort of retcons his origin story and X4, but we'll get there in time. And the voice acting isn't too bad. It's hit and miss, sure. Like, I love Lucas Gibbertson as Zero, but I swear every time he plays up the drama, it sounds like he's about to burst into a fit of laughter. Change the world? Sounds like Maverick talked to me. Perpetrator was so skilled. Not many Reploids have specs that high. But most importantly, the gameplay was pretty much left intact. If you played the SNES game, you can play this no problem. I think it's a little easier to boot. Like, I find it easier to read enemy attacks because of 3D animations being easier to distinguish. So if you thought the SNES game was too much, give the PSP 
remake a try. Miles' campaign is a neat bonus, giving you the option to play through the game as this greasy douchebag, but I don't find him as enjoyable as X. He can't dash for starters, and it was really fucking hard to break that habit. And he has miserable defense, making the intro stage, out of all things, one of the hardest in the game, believe it or not. And though he has a large selection of arm cannons, shoulder cannons, and foot bombs, they're not as visually exciting or as satisfying to use as X's special weapons. Now, I love how his ammo rapidly regenerates, but enemies can still drop weapon ammo as if you're playing as X. For Vile, that's just a waste of time. I'm just trying to refill my energy because I'm low on health, but weapon ammo keeps dropping and I'm getting nowhere. Every once in a while you can find Vile's special ride armor, which you would think is something he'd be able to call at any point given how big of a deal it was in the original game. And it's good for mowing down enemies, but it's got a pathetically short time limit that goes down faster whenever you take a hit. I don't, I don't get that. It's also required for certain upgrades. The sub tank and storm eagle stage is next to fucking impossible to get because you have to make sure your ride armor blows up in front of these containers that's preceded by a shitload of floating platforms with enemies on them to drain your timer. It's a crapshoot. It makes me think Vile's campaign was kind of slapdash into the product. I also don't like how every stage plays the same song. It's a cool theme, but why make it the only song you hear until the Sigma stages? A very strange decision, but on the plus side, you can sort of hover in midair by mashing the shoulder cannon button, which might be an unintentional thing, but I can fly over a good chunk of launch octopus and stage, there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it. I was able to beat this mode, but it wasn't that great of a time. I'll take X any day. Maverick Hunter X is a good buy. If you got a PSP, I don't think it would hurt to hunt down a physical copy, but if you also have a PS Vita, it's on the PlayStation Network for a mere 10 bucks. A damn good deal in my opinion. No matter what version you get on the Super Nintendo and the PSP, the game delivers and then some again. One of my favorites of all time, I implore you to please give it a shot. I'm premiering this video at Too Many Games, I know there's bound to be one or two vendors out there that has a million copies of this, so please, please play it. Give it a shot, see if you like it. You got nothing to lose, it's only about like an hour and a half long, so yeah. But hey, I mean, fuck, I mean, we're just starting this marathon, we're already at a very, very high point, so I mean, how will the other games fare? We'll find out next time with a double review of Mega Man X2 and Mega Man X3 on the Super Nintendo. With all that said, thank you all for watching. Have yourselves a fantastic, oh fuck, I forgot about the iPhone version. Well, we have to give that one a shot and see how it holds. <laughs>